So uh, to everyone uh, uh, participating this morning in our uh, opening uh, uh, speaker session, uh, welcome to day three of the Acquisition uh, Research Symposium. Uh, so this is our symposium Aloha Day, for those of you that uh, know Hawaiian culture. Uh, yesterday, we heard inspirational words and substantive uh, guidance from Jay Stephanie, Lieutenant General Thurgood, Lieutenant General Todd, Lieutenant General Williamson, uh, Brigadier General Michael Sloan, Thomas McDermott, Admiral Doug Small, Major General Cameron Holt, Admiral Lawrence Selby, Jill Boward, David Kleiss and a host of uh, acquisition luminaries and researchers. Wednesday's attendee attendees asked tough probing questions and sparked spirited discussions. Mr. Stephanie's presentation and discussion was particularly well received. So he set a high bar uh, for you, John. Uh, so well done everybody's uh, attendees yesterday. Uh, Today, we'll be hearing from uh, Vice Admiral John Hill, uh, Dr. Arun Serafin, uh, Dr. Denise Verma, uh, Dean Schneider, our very own Dean Schneider, Rear Admiral Jason Lloyd, Lieutenant General Dave Bassett, my favorite human being on the planet because he relieved me at DCMA, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Morley, uh, Robert Stoddard, Pete Mulganari, and the esteemed Mr. Reuben Pitts, plus several more acquisition leaders. Uh, I'll be introducing Vice Admiral Hill in just a couple of minutes, but uh, first I'd like to brag a bit about the NPS's acquisition curriculum. The Graduate School of Defense Management, ARP's host school, uh, supports degree granting and certificate granting curriculum in program management, contracting, business administration, manage management, with specializations depending on the program and acquisition management, defense management, financial management, information management, logistics management, manpower systems analysis, and defense systems analysis, plus more than two dozen professional certifi certificate programs. The Graduate School of Defense Management is accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, WASC. In addition, the Graduate School of Defense Management has the distinction of being one of only a few institutions in the world to have its graduate management programs accredited by both the Association to Advanced Colleges, Schools of Businesses, AASCSB, the premier accrediting association from schools of businesses, and the National Association of Schools of Public Affairs and Administration, uh, NASPA, the premier accrediting, accrediting association for schools and public administration. Uh, over 665 students are in residence or enrolled in distance learning programs in GSDM, and we graduate about 290 students every year, military and civilian, resident and distance learning. And as I mentioned yesterday, about 100 of those students uh, have worked and sponsored through uh, AARP. And now I'd like to introduce our kickoff speaker for today, uh, Vice Admiral John Hill, a service warfare officer and engineering duty officer. Uh, when I introduce naval officers, I always like to talk about their sea duty. Uh, Admiral Hill was pretty shy about uh, his public listings of his sea duty. It took me quite a while, even with the internet, to dig around, and I came up with USS Richard E. Byrd, DDG-23. How did I do, John? He did great. Awesome, Chuck. <laughs> uh, so just for those of you that don't know, that's a DDG-2 class ship, 1,200-pound steam. Uh, that's old school. That's way old school. And um, John's service reputation is he is an ice man, completely calm in a crisis. You know, the worst you'll get out of him is golly, gee whiz. And, uh, and now I know why. Because on a 1,200-pound uh, DDG-2 class, every day was Armageddon. Every day was a crisis and a disaster of the highest order. Uh, I did one tour on a 1,200-pound ship, and that was plenty for me. Um, so uh, John is a, was the Aegis Combat Systems Program Manager, plus multiple other Aegis tours. Uh, trying to get over the trauma of being on a first-generation uh, Tartar ship uh, where you literally had to uh, throw chicken bones and uh, have St. Christopher medals to try to figure out how to get a missile off the rail, much less actually haven't hit anything. And, uh, that, was, that, was, that was extra credit. Uh, <laughs> um, he's had tours at the Joint Staff J6, CNO Strategic Studies Group, I'm deeply envious, and at the, uh, at the Engineering Duty Officer School. Uh, John and I are like Mars and Venus, same orbits, never collided, uh, different views. So we 
uh, ships passing in the night, if you will. Uh, he comes to us now as the director of the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, for those of you that are MPS, he spoke uh, with us as a superintendent's guest lecturer just, what, uh, three, four weeks ago. So, uh, so welcome, John. Uh, and you are our uh, closeout speaker, our startup speaker for our closeout day of this symposium. So thank you very much for your time. And over to you, we'll take questions. Uh, I will gather questions up as they're asked, and then I will uh, give you the questions uh, for participants. If you see a question you like, you can upvote it. That'll kick it to the top of the queue. It'll make my job easier as to which questions to ask. And if you don't ask questions, I'll make up questions. So over to you, John. Thank you very much for coming today. Hey, uh, Admiral Lewis, uh, great, great to see you, and, and thanks for that uh, very interesting uh, introduction. That's probably the first uh, different interpretation of a bio that I've ever heard, but my mom would be proud. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I don't know if you're pushing my view graphs or if I can't see them, uh, but um, I apologize uh, for my uh, my tardiness here. We we had a uh, problem with the uh, uh, the DNS servers uh, going down, so we're, we're coming into a MiFi device, and so hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, now I can't hear you, Dave. We're oh, pushing your video. You're pushing. Hey, there, there they are. All right. So let, let's go. Just to, uh, I'm going to try to get us back on the time here. If you can just go ahead and flip to the first chart. I always like to start with a uh, discussion on alignment. And uh, the, the faces you've seen here, I think uh, uh, certainly from the Secretary of Defense perspective, you heard uh, several people speak about that over the last couple of days. So I, I won't spend uh, much time here other than to say that I'm totally aligned uh, with the Secretary of Defense's um, uh, priorities. Uh, but I also kind of uh, cue in on many of his speaking engagements. And we talked about tools, technology, weapons, and training. Uh, that certainly res resonates uh, with the men and women uh, at the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, when I think about who my boss is in the joint world, uh, that's that's the chairman. And when he talks about mastering those technologies, also a great fit uh, for the Missile Defense Agency. And some of you may be wondering why I defer to uh, the head of a strategic command. Uh, you may not know that the agency gets its requirements through a, a yearly missile defense integrated priorities list that uh, comes down from STRATCOM. Um, and so uh, ability to deter strategic tax to nine benefits and impose costs. And uh, probably one of the largest challenges that Admiral Richard has is that balance between uh, the deterrence uh, methods of conventional nuclear force capabilities uh, versus the defense capabilities, right? It's always a balance. Uh, but uh, I enjoy uh, working with all the three gentlemen you see here and their respective staffs. So you can go to the next uh, chart, please. So I always like to start uh, with the threat. Um, I have spent uh, most of my career, as Admiral Lewis kind of pointed out, uh, you know, in the Aegis world and standard missile and uh, every brief we've ever given, we start with the threat because that really is what drives you when you're developing a system uh, to take on uh, what the adversaries bring to the table. Uh, the charter of the agency is really focused in on the rogue nations. And when you think about that, it's in the upper left-hand corner of this chart. And it's to give you a sense of range. Uh, now, this is we, we wouldn't be normally launching uh, ICBMs or anything else out of the uh, state of Maine, uh, but I want to give just a sense of scale, right? So range is really important, right? And you've read about that in the news. You've seen a lot of activity over the last few years. If you're able to get a classified view of the number of things that are flying around the globe, you would be stunned. Uh, incredible test programs going on, uh, you know, from rogue nations, from other adversaries around the world. Uh, they're constantly uh, up in their game. And when you look at the speed regimes on the lower left uh, part of the chart, uh, probably a little known fact is that uh, as a ballistic missile comes back into the atmosphere, it is at hypersonic speeds. So we've been dealing with hypersonic uh, speeds for a long time within the agency. And as we move towards hypersonic glide vehicle defense, uh, that's nothing new. But what is new uh, is the maneuver capability. Right, and I'll talk more about that as we go. So think speed and maneuver, right? Uh, if you'd have talked to me two or three years ago, I would have spent more time talking about the things in the upper right chart of the chart, uh, precision strike, decoys, jamming devices, countermeasures with writ large. Multiple warheads is the challenge of the future. And it's not just with the near peer adversaries. We are seeing this across the globe and, and that technology is proliferating. It is a real problem problem for the defense of the homeland. It's a real problem for our four deployed forces and allies. And so that is the focus of the uh, missile defense agencies that take on these evolving threats. And the way that we do that is we strengthen our sensor architectures, we strengthen our command and control, and we certainly want to make sure that we're getting the weapons uh, that the warfighters need to, to carry on the battle. I won't spend any time talking about the parades on the lower right. You see enough of those. Uh, we'll let the intel community interpret what these are. All right, uh, next chart, please. So this is the uh, Missile Defense Agency uh, placemat. 
And uh, this is what I go home and uh, quiz my 15 year old daughter on every night. And she's gotten very good at going to the bottom first, saying that it starts with sensing, right? Um, Emma Lewis used always tell me if you can't see it, uh, you can't shoot it. Uh, so in a ballistic fight, what you'll normally see is you'll get indications and warning coming from the overhead assets. And so that flash is what you see first, but that's not good enough for fire control. So when I say fire control, that is posi uh, position, velocity, and acceleration accuracy that you need to put a weapon on target. And so you want to have sensors uh, on that uh, incoming threat throughout as much of the phase of flight as you possibly can. And so the threat that you see, uh, that nice uh, curved uh, ballistic track across the top, that's a pretty pr predictable one, right? So when the quarterback throws a football, it's predicting where it's going to go, right? You know where that's going to go, right? Gravity just brings it on down. And that's a fairly predictable track that will normally uh, you know, initiate uh, a fire control solution for you because you know what defended asset uh, that this thing is going after. We added in the hypersonic threat a couple years ago uh, as a challenge to ourselves to say, what can we bring forward? What do we have now in a capabilities-based organization? What is out there now that can take this on? And I'll talk about more of that later, but you'll see kind of an initial ballistic track if it's ground-based. Uh, it can be air-launched. These can be cruise missile uh, launched. There's lots of different ways that the start of the, of the fight goes. So will you get indications and warning from the overhead assets of something that's small and running hot that doesn't necessarily fly up to be captured by your space sensors, but you transition from indications and warning from space and you fly across a radar uh, field of view and that's where you get your first bit of fire control quality data, right? And then you need to go to the third step and we call that discrimination. And that means picking out the lethal object. So back to the ballistic track, one of the most interesting things about radars is that they play kitty soccer on everything, right? Radars love just tracking anything that's up there. So you have to kind of ferret out what is that lethal object? What is the RV? Because you've got booster tanks, you've got solid fuel chuff, you've got separation events uh, with F2 control modules, those sorts of things, right? And then there's those wonderful countermeasures that, uh, that are meant to confuse the sensor architecture. So you have to deal with all of that. So how does the warfighter touch the system, right? So from a large homeland defense perspective, they're looking and peering through the command and control and battle management at the top of the chart. Think of this as command and control and battle management, which is really that fire control solution that I was talking about. And when you launch one of the missiles that you see on the chart here, we're constantly talking to them. And why do we do that? because there's a lot of uncertainty in the flight, certainly with that gold trajectory coming across the middle, right? If they're maneuvering upon boost, if they're maneuvering in the glide phase, and you know they're gonna maneuver when they come back into the atmosphere, you have to have a sensor on them so you can take out the error. And there's lots of different ways that we manage the error budget. It's, it's in the sensors, it's in the fire control, and when the missile goes off and opens up its seeker, it has to take out the rest of the uncertainty so it can get a hit. And we do hit to kill technology uh, and that means we're not really carrying warheads. We're just using kinetic energy to impart that on the incoming. Uh, pretty important when you're dealing with what could be an ambiguous nuclear warhead coming in. All right, so that's, that's enough to kind of get us started on this one. But GBI is in the center of the chart. That's the ground-based interceptors. That's for Homeland Defense. Hardest set of requirements on any missile I've ever seen. All 50 states. We cover all 50 states with the GBI. That is the requirement on that missile against a really hard countermeasure suite, against very fast flying uh, coming from uh, rogue nations and, and passing through a sensor architecture. So as you move on from there for, you know, primarily maybe a Navy audience, uh, now that the, uh, the school has gotten so diverse, um, I know I'm speaking to Army and Air Force and Space Force Guardians and all of that, but uh, SM3 uh, Block 2A, uh, that is our newest uh, production missile, the code de development with Japan, adds a lot of complexity to a program, but there's a reason for that, right? We've got some indo PACOM threats that really stress the robustness of systems. And so the, the SM3 Block 2A was meant to take on a broader range of threats on a longer range and at higher speed profiles. Uh, the SM3 Block 1B, that's the workhorse of the fleet. Uh, those are out there now in numbers, and that, that is how we handle ballistic attacks on the sea base. Then you have terminal high altitude air defense. That's the Army's deployable system. Uh, we've got those deployed around the world. We've got a garrison of those that we can send out. We practice uh, dynamic force employment with the Army all the time. Uh, fantastic system, kind of engages right on the edge of the atmosphere and, and into space. And then uh, down in the lower tier, uh, the Aegis Sea Base Terminal, this, what this is is leveraging the Navy's very high and agile uh, SM6 missile. We bring in a software package in coordination uh, with the Navy to take on something we call Sea Base Terminal. That is going after the advanced threat. That is a maneuvering, very high speed threat that's coming in to threaten the sea base. We've got a major test uh, coming up here in the next uh, week or so where we're going to do a dual salvo, taking on a really high end threat. And, you know, 
part of that is to confirm and complete the certification so we can deploy those rounds in that configuration. And then uh, down at the bottom, the Patriot system, another great Army deployable system, also a hit to kill. Uh, it's got its own radar, its own fire control, and we have that integrated uh, into the overall missile defense system. All right, uh, next chart. So what's different about the Missile Defense Agency? You, you heard the OSD view from Ms. Cummings and then lots of other discussions on really that theme of pushing decisions down to the lowest competent level. I think uh, Mr. Stephanie talked about that yesterday. When you look at the overall life cycle at the top of the chart here, but you realize that once you deploy something, uh, the threat's gonna continue to evolve, right? Back to the first chart, right? So you have to incorporate a modernization program. And so if you take that linear view that we're used to looking at from DOD 5000 and you put it into a circle, this is the world in which we live uh, in the agency, right? So if I start at the bottom where, you know, that's material uh, solutions analysis, we start there, we come up through tech development, we go into product development, and we're getting input from the warfighter through that STRATCOM process that I mentioned a little bit earlier called the warfighter involvement process. Then we get into production, we go to testing. You see a lot of the high profile tests uh, that we do around the globe. Uh, mentioned that we're gonna be doing one out in the Pacific. We've got another one going up in uh, Kodiak, Alaska, you know, in June, and we're doing formidable shield right now out in the UK off the coast of Hebrides. Uh, about uh, 15 ships or so from about nine nations all participating in integrated air and missile defense exercises. And so uh, getting it to the fleet, putting it into the hands of the sailors, into the hand of the war fighters, uh, we learn a lot, and uh, once we field, we're constantly modernizing and coming back. So what, what do we do at the agencies? Kind of on the lower right-hand side, um, you know, we have milestone decision authority, you know, uh, and I work uh, with uh, Undersecretary r &E, but predominantly the Undersecretary for ANS, so Ms. Cummings. And recently, she and I had a discussion the other day about delegating decisions for some production pieces that we needed to do, and she delegated those down. We do that. Uh, but normally for large production, I will go to ANS for those production decisions. Head of agency, head of contracting. Um, and the program manager piece is really important because what we do that's different from the services is we manage the whole missile defense portfolio as a system. So when I showed you that prior chart, what we're able to do is throttle the upgrades to the C2BMC spiral capability with those different missile fire control systems and those sensors so that we deliver in increments. And so we tell the warfighter, this is what's coming. This is how everything's been brought together for this new capability. Sometimes it's upgrades to Homeland Defense. Sometimes it's very focused in our regional. Sometimes it's focused on discrimination across all the sensors, across all the missiles, across all the fire control. And so, so by synchronizing those, that's what kind of makes us a little bit different. And then we have this thing called IAMD, Integrated Air Missile Defense Tech Authority. Uh, next chart, please. So this is kind of pictorial of a number of systems uh, to the left. They're going through those evolution cycles, right? So they're simultaneous and we synchronize those. And that little inset that you can see there to the right uh, is not really meant for you to, to read, but those are different increments. Uh, and when they come to bear and when we go through an operational capability baseline, working with the command commands to say, this is what you have now. All right, so I won't spend any more time on this one. Uh, next chart. Okay, so I'd like to talk to you about one of our most recent uh, flight tests. This is a flight test maritime. This was congressionally mandated uh, to do a defense of Hawaii scenario where an Aegis ship with the SM-3 Block 2A missile would engage an intercontinental ballistic missile. So think long time of flight, think sensor coverage or lack thereof and what that means uh, for fire control. This is really a COVID-19 story. We originally had planned to do this uh, back in May of 2020. But uh, when the Republic of Marshall Islands, a sovereign country, closed down and said, we really don't want you bringing people in because we haven't had a single case of COVID-19, we had to back off. And so that meant we put the target into caretaker status. Why is that an important story? Well, we had help from the Army Space and Missile Defense Command that runs Kwajalein. Uh, they took care of the target for us, kept in the caretaker status, charged the batteries, you know, those sorts of things. And then we came back and we did stacking operations later. While we deconflicted ranges and deconflicted time and built our shadow teams, made sure we worked closely with the Navy to keep the ship healthy. That's the USS uh, John Finn there. Um, we, we brought all that together. It, it was really an all hands evolution coming across the department, US Coast Guard out there clearing the range to make sure we could have range safety. Uh, lots of sensors on target to capture telemetry, uh, get the end game uh, captured so that we know we, we had a hit. Most of the folks thought that this event would really be about closing velocity in the end game, right? I mentioned before high speeds, right? And that's, that's a real challenge for fixed sites. 
but it's different when you have a Navy ship that can maneuver and is looking for the highest probability of kill. The ship will go for a broadside hit, and we learned that by looking at the analysis. And it turns out that the real uh, challenge in this shot was the amount of divert, which is really the maneuver of the kinetic warhead as it goes in for that hit to kill in the end. So we learned a lot, and we're still uh, capturing data off of this one. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, play a video for you, or I'll ask the good people at uh, you know, Postgraduate School to go ahead and kick off the video, and I'll shut up for a minute. Let me make sure I get sound on for you. Hold on there. All right. The U.S. Navy conducted Flight Test Aegis Weapon System 44. FTM 44 was a demonstration of the Aegis Weapon System using the standard Missile 3 Block 2 Alpha Interceptor to defeat a simple intercontinental ballistic missile threat. MDA personnel launched a three-stage threat representative ICBM target from the Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Defense Test Site, located on Kwajalein Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Shortly after launch, satellites detected and acquired the in-flight target and provided information to the Command and Control Battle Management and Communication System in Colorado Springs. C2BMC passed the target data to the Aegis Weapons System on an Aegis BMD ship, the USS John Finn, stationed in the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles to the east of Hawaii. Sailors on the USS John Finn used the tracking data to develop a firing solution. The ship then launched the SM3 Block II Alpha using only the remotely provided satellite data, referred to as Engage on Remote. Once it reached the engagement zone, and following its ejection from the SM-3 Block II Alpha third-stage rocket motor-guided section, the kill vehicle took mere moments to acquire the re-entry vehicle. As it approached the target, the kill vehicle continued to process its sensor data and refine its flight path. During these moments, the kill vehicle is also collecting and processing data to identify the target and then select the correct aim point. After using its divert thrusters to complete several maneuvers to finalize its path to target reentry vehicle, the kill vehicle intercepted and destroyed the RV over the Pacific Ocean north of Hawaii. The successful execution of FTM-44 demonstrated the additional capability inherent in the Aegis Weapons System equipped with SM-3 Block II Alpha for more robust regional defense against evolving ballistic missile threats. Okay, so a couple things I didn't mention when I was giving you the quick overview. Uh, engage on remote, that is another air budget challenge for us, right? A lot of uncertainty, long propagated times. And so in the end game, when we looked at the analysis, it was the longest propagated track that we had ever done on any test, meaning we did not have a sensor on it. It was flying and uh, when the SM3 was launched uh, and being guided by the ship, uh, you know, when it opens its seeker, right, we got to make sure uh, we can see what we've got. So uh, that's all done through error budget analysis and uh, the ship did well. The other thing I left out is the fact that, um, you know, the ship wasn't designed to do this uh, and nor was the missile designed to do this. And so what we were doing is exploring uh, the robustness in the system, right? So the fact that Aegis uh, destroyers and cruisers were initially designed for air defense threats and then we leveraged them into space tracking. And now we have a missile that was designed for an intermediate threat was able to take out an intercontinental uh, ballistic threat. Uh, pretty amazing stuff, right? So uh, hats off uh, to the team, uh, to the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard, our space uh, defenders and guardians. Uh, it's a, it was a pretty amazing event. All right, let's go to the next chart. The Missile Defense Agency. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, space. I'll kind of take you back to threat. I mentioned before that what you've seen, and you, you've seen it in the white press, uh, that many of the launches that we see maneuver upon boost call that a dog leg, right? So that's done specifically to outrun your uh, your radar uh, coverage uh, where you're on the earth looking up, right? So if they dog leg early or if they extend uh, in space um, or if they maneuver heavily or maneuver in the glide phase, you have a global problem, right? Um, I think it's uh, General Haydn that likes to say we're running out of islands in the Pacific uh, to put radars. Uh, and so really the only answer is, is to look down from cold space onto the warm earth, which creates a heck of a track problem, but we're working our way uh, through that. 
I mentioned up on the left, the, uh, the overhead assets that see that initial flash, right? Then we normally pass through a radar face to give us that fire control quality data and later discrimination. And then we're using the communication satellites. Uh, we are using uh, something called the uh, hypersonic ballistic tracking space sensor, which we will put it to on orbit uh, in the 23 uh, timeframe. And that's based on prototyping and demo, which is the STSS you see there, the space tracking and surveillance system. We have two of those up now. We're getting ready to bring them down in the next couple of years. Uh, they had a service life of, I think, about four years. They've been up there, you know, around a dozen years. So it's really amazing when you leverage uh, commercial technology and you make sure that uh, you're uh, putting the right kind of technology in for some specific time. There's robustness there, and we've really gotten a lot uh, out of the STSS program uh, before we bring them down. But we'll replace them with the hypersonic uh, ballistic tracking sensor system where we will tie into uh, the overall uh, space defense uh, architecture. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we have uh, space-based kill assessment deployed now. Uh, we have a, a pretty large constellation of those that are looking to confirm again, whether or not we've had a hit and a little more algorithm work and a little more oper operationalizing of that system, we'll be able to give a firm kill uh, to the warfighter. So space is very important, uh, not only for the future of missile defense, uh, it's important for just about every mission we're trying to execute out there. And this just kind of sums up what we're doing on the missile defense side. Uh, okay, next chart. So I'm asked all the time, what are we doing about hypersonic defense, all right? So there's that lovely uh, boosted profile to the right uh, where it's going up. It's going to be detected, likely classified as a ballistic missile initially, right? You'll have to do a little more work as it comes down and goes into its glide phase. And then that glide phase is where it can maneuver and get that global coverage and it can fly away from where we have our air defense and our space defense uh, radars. That's a problem, right? So that's why we're going to deploy uh, the hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor. It's not just for hypersonics, but uh, in those upper stages, they're using different propellant these days, and it's dim, very hard to see, very hard to track. And so being able to look down from cold space onto that warm track, uh, it becomes uh, you know, an achievable goal. We learned a lot by uh, tracking a lot of real world events. And uh, we ran that through our models and said, you know, there is an, the ability to not just defend in terminal, which we can do today with C-based terminal SM6, and that's on the left side of the, uh, the chart, but we can move back up into that trajectory and threaten them in the glide phase. And if you mess them up in the glide phase, it's very hard to come back in the atmosphere to get to the intended target. And so uh, we just recently put out a broad area announcement. Uh, we're getting some great uh, uh, ideas coming in from industry and we'll go into a, a competitive uh, phase uh, to, to move quickly in a capabilities-based approach, which means we will leverage what we have in terms of booster stacks. It's gonna be a different front end or a modified front end of what we already have out there. And that's what buys us a lot of speed. So just part of the acquisition story back to that, where you get a lot of speed is where the decisions are made, right? There's uh, no surprise to me that Mr. Stephanie wants to move decisions down the chain, right? Because that just speeds you up. You're not trapped in this world of waiting for someone uh, on a staff someplace in the Pentagon to approve something, right? You make the decision at the appropriate level and then the program moves on and it moves a lot faster, right? So decision speed is key. Uh, and then for the Missile Defense Agency as a capabilities-based uh, organization, the ability to leverage and evolve technology quickly, and you go with the most mature technology possible. And, uh, and that's how we're gonna get, uh, get to this problem uh, here quickly in the next uh, few years. Okay, next chart, please. And this will be my wrap. Uh, you, you saw the circle earlier, uh, at the end of the day, uh, our number one mission is to deliver capability to the warfighter. And we start by maturing technology, we develop that technology, we get to production, we get to testing, we, we produce, uh, and then we put it out in the field and we work with the services uh, for operations and sustainment. I'm often asked, when do you transfer to the services? It's at the top of the chart. Uh, as soon as we deliver something uh, to the fleet, for example, uh, the ship runs off, they're doing their piece, they're doing operations, and then we're helping them with sustainment uh, for the unique uh, BMD pieces. Um, and you see some examples of other things. We have a great partnership with the Air Force for the UEWRs, uh, great partnership with the Space Force on radars around the planet. Uh, the GBIs, the ground-based interceptors, you see them to the left. We're building out the missile fields up in Fort Greeley. Ships are underway. Aegis the shores are operational. We're finishing up uh, Poland in the next uh, year or two. Uh, FAD batteries are ready to roll. And then I mentioned space capability there. So that takes me to a wrap. And uh, back to uh, Admiral Lewis, and uh, we'll take some questions. All right. Thank you, John. That's always uh, exciting to hear you speak and uh, learn something new. Learn a new word today. Chuff. Hey, there we go. Lord. And uh, a little bit of trivia for you. I don't know if you can see this. This is a piece of the USS John Finn. Uh, happen to have it in my office. 
And that was the first of the restart TDGs, if you remember. Yes. Uh, that ship would not have existed as a uh, missile defense asset had uh, uh, different decisions been made back in 2010, 2011. So, uh, so it's good to see uh, taxpayer money being put to good, uh, good use. Yeah, absolutely. A great ship, by the way. One thing I didn't mention is, you know, part of risk reduction before we went to uh, that most recent test is that ship was out there tracking the ICBM target and the outgoing uh, GBIs when we did salvo test uh, back in the spring of 19. So a well-trained uh, crew, well-trained uh, group of officers on that ship that executed. Really proud of them. That was built for the keel up as a BMD capable ship too. Absolutely. We, we call that uh, the Navy's doing it in stride. That's uh, great. <laughs> So lots of questions. I'll start uh, one from the eminent uh, Mr. Ruben Pitts. Uh, given the worldwide demand for missiles and the rapid pace of the emerging threat, are you satisfied with your, bal your balance of procurement and R&D funds? Yeah, that's, that's, that's always a hard one, right? Um, I, when, when I was uh, growing up in this world, uh, looking up at, uh, you know, then uh, Commander and Captain Lewis, right? Um, you know, back then, production numbers were, were pretty high. Uh, and we, we were building at a very uh, fast rate. Uh, and then there was sort of this big change and we spent more time in development. So no, I'm never satisfied with uh, uh, the production numbers. Um, I would say the services are not uh, satisfied with production numbers. Uh, we work with them uh, every day uh, on inventory objectives and then we work very hard to get to those inventory objectives, uh, but it does uh, run slow. I would say that we're not maxing out our production lines. Uh, that's just a fact and it is a dollar issue for sure. Uh, on the research and development side, uh, we're, we're pretty healthy there. Um, I would say the challenge for us as an agency is, you know, our the center of what we do is ballistic missile defense. As we've been asked and directed by Congress to do hypersonic missile defense, right? It's it's basically within that same top line. And then as we're challenged by Northcom to help them with the strategic cruise missile problem to the homeland, you know, yet that's another challenge for us. And so I live in a world, uh, Ruben, where I make nobody happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question from Mallory Shelbourne, uh, USNI News. Uh, yesterday, you said there's a policy policy discussion about using ships for homeland defense. What is the Navy's appetite and capacity to use TDGs for homeland defense? Yeah, it's. Uh, I tell you what, that's that's. A, it's a really tough question, and it definitely is a uh, policy issue. I think technically we can do anything, right? And our, our job is to provide the services and the combatant commands options, right? So part of executing this congressionally mandated ICBM shot uh, from a ship was to check feasibility and then determine what we need to do to move forward should the nation make a decision to use uh, ships in that role. Um, we have great capability with the GBIs today, uh, the ground-based uh, mid-course defense system and those GBIs, and we have a next-generation interceptor uh, you know, under competition uh, today. So I, I'm, I'm very confident. I think if you ask General Van Herk from Northcom about his confidence in defending the nation today, the answer would be confident. Uh, but as the threat evolves, right, then you start to see a little change uh, in that view. And so the, it's been viewed for a while that uh, the Navy can play a role in that area, but it becomes a, uh, an asset problem, right? Uh, there are only so many ships we have out there and they're multi-mission ships and they have a lot of roles around the globe to execute. Um, so it's, it's one of those sort of where I'm really not in the decision loop other than doing the technical aspects so those options exist. So the conversation will continue and uh, it's, it's anybody's guess as to where it will go. Are you still expanding the uh, GBI field up in Alaska? Is that, uh, we are. Okay. We are. Yeah, we, we uh, built uh, 20 new silos. We've completed the silos. Another great COVID-19 story. We leveraged the waterways uh, during uh, COVID-19 so that we weren't flying uh, people in. We just we just brought it up through the water channels. We delivered the silos and we finished up the uh, uh, installing the last uh, of the 20th uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. And now we're doing the uh, silo integration piece. And so that gives flexibility to the warfighter because now we can take some of the oldest rounds, move them to those silos. We can upgrade those silos. We can upgrade the missiles. And so if our adversaries listen, I know they always are, um, you know, we can defend. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> a question uh, from Kaglia Balakistrahan. I'm sorry, I mispronounced that. Uh, the tensions in South China Sea is increasing, but most of the countries in the Indo-Pacific do not have the sufficient level of defense capability to take on the real threat escalating in the region. This week, I read about the collaboration between Lockheed Martin and Thales Australia for team agreement for guided weapons manufacturing capability. Will this be the U.S.'s future strategy in terms of how it builds the defense capability of its partner nations and allies? 
Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great. Fine. Yeah, it, it's 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 a great question. You know, if you go back and you look at the mission statement, right? Uh, it, it is layered defense. That's why I, I like to talk about different layers, right? And that may be the naval officer in me because we like a lot of different layers uh, for defense. It's to defend the country, our four deployed forces, and our allies uh, against all phases of attack. So uh, we all we all recognize uh, many years ago that we can't do this by ourselves, right? Uh, the Navy is never going to be as large as we want it to be. We're not going to have the weapons, uh, you know, count in numbers that, that Ruben was kind of pointing out earlier. So the best way to do that is to establish those partnerships. And uh, in the Pacific area, we've got strong partnerships. Uh, you know, just just name a country, right? Whether it's Japan, it's uh, South Korea, uh, working very closely with those nations. We do rim of the Pacific exercises uh, on the uh, even number years. I mentioned Hebrides earlier, so we're working with the NATO countries. And, uh, and it's really about operating together, right? And they will often make investments, whether it's through uh, some version of architecture work or doing uh, co-studies together, a lot of s and work going on, co-development, as I mentioned in the s and Block 2A, there's FMS sales, foreign military sales, and then there's sustainment, right? So that whole chain uh, is, is a cooperative opportunity across the board and it really builds uh, those friends and allies so that we're not uh, handling this by ourselves. Oh, excellent. Question from uh, Dr. Robert Morlock uh, from uh, NPS, our own Graduate School of Defense Management. Uh, sir, when we consider IMD, the concept was to be able to shoot any missile from any sensor data. Can you cam comment on progress to make this happen? For example, can we use Patriot radar data to shoot an SM missile? And can we shoot a THAAD missile from EASA sensor data or Patriot sensor data? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And of course, that, that is a visionary statement. I think everybody knows that when you have a sensor, it's purpose built for a part of the battle space, right? So the FAD radar is built with a particular range and sensitivity, right? So it's not going to work for everything, right? Would you like it to? Sure, so would I, right? Uh, Aegis uh, ships, right? Are they going to be able to do everything? We built them for air defense, but they're now tracking space objects. We're working with uh, Space Command, by the way, to task ships to track space objects. That's pretty cool. So it kind of talks to what you're getting into. But I would tell you, it goes right back to the error budget analysis I talked about earlier, right? Unfortunately, there's a lot of hard engineering work to ensure that you can actually pull that thread, you know, for what Dave, you and I have been schooled in, right? Detect, control, engage. From the time you sense it to the control to putting the weapon on target, you have to worry about the uncertainties in that fire control chain. So um, any sensor, any weapon is really easy to say. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's, it requires some hard engineering to make sure you can do that. And again, you have to take into account that the Patriot missile only flies so far and it's got a specific frequency for uplink downlink, right? So your flexibility to plug it into Aegis is a little bit different because Aegis uses a different frequency for controlling standard missiles. So you, I don't know a single program out there that says, let's, let's go all have, uh, have every frequency available for controlling any missile on the planet, right? We would never uh, produce those systems. It's really tough. Uh, but just to kind of make you feel better, uh, we do. Uh, we are finishing up the third phase of uh, THAAD and Patriot integration. The first phase was to remote the launchers from THAAD to give the command and command flexibility. The second one was to do launch on remote, engage on remote from a THAAD battery to a Patriot battery. And then the test we'll be doing uh, towards the end of this uh, fiscal year will be then to control the Patriot launcher from a THAAD battery. So that integration is there. We have Aegis and THAAD integrated uh, in, in regions that uh, I won't get into specifically. But that integration work can be done. It is being done uh, today, but it's not as simple again as any sensor, any weapon. Like for instance, you can't use a sonar to control a missile. Yep. They're just in different mediums. Do you have uh, okay. a touch points with Operation Overmatch uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the DOD program that that supports? Yeah, we really do. And, and I will tell you that uh, that is a great initiative by the Navy to synchronize uh, the, the strike groups and, and all the Navy assets. Mm -hmm. We're working with JADC2. That's really our tie-in uh, back to the Navy's project overmatch. And I mentioned CTBMC. That is our integrating element for all sensors, uh, all weapons, all fire control systems uh, within the missile defense system. Okay. A uh, question from uh, Nick Curtin, uh, alumni of UIWS. Uh, building new missiles takes time. What investments are happening under the kill vehicle? Yeah, uh, thank, thanks for asking that. I'll just use an example. Uh, so when I mentioned the, the hypersonic defense glide phase uh, interceptor, right? There's two approaches, right? One is the near term. What can you do with existing booster stacks? What can you do with existing uh, kill vehicles with some slight modifications, right? What can you do there to go quickly? But in parallel, we're running the science and technology, burning down technical risk and new divert systems, new propellants, 
new seekers, you have to do the material science if you're going to operate in a different regime. The glide, the, the glide regime is wildly different than being down in the atmosphere and up in space. And so there are significant investments going into that uh, area, working very closely with DARPA as an example. Uh, they have a program that is specifically focused in on divert systems for hypersonic defense. And then we marry that up with the seeker and materials work that we're doing. Uh, thermal protection has become a big issue uh, when you're dealing with the hypersonic uh, threat. So it's uh, for all you material science people out there, um, it's, you're gonna, you, you have a wide open uh, you know, view of the future. Uh, folks that are working on secret materials and GAN technology and the future technologies for sensing, uh, it's, it's all out there. Um, we have a long way to go. So follow up from Nick, uh, are you employing any new software development approaches for the C2 functions for BMD? E.g. continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, DevSecOps, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, why did I know Nick was going to ask that question? Um, so, yeah, ab ab absolutely. In fact, the, uh, the premier program that I'll mention, uh, again, is the Next Generation Interceptor. That's a model-based uh, system engineering approach for that one. So we, we have established the cloud. We have established the tools. We have the newest and, uh, and the best tools uh, to, to run through that program, but specifically on CTVMC because it is a spiral upgrade program because as the integrating element that throttles along with the development for delivering increments, uh, we have no choice. We, we have to go to Agile. We have to leverage DevOps. We have to leverage new ways of doing things, particularly if we're going to sync back up with the uh, project overmatch. Excellent. So a question from John Camp, uh, George Washington University. Uh, amazing story, uh, BZ, and thank you. Uh, talk about FM44. Uh, were there any risk management approaches used for FTM44 that you think might have broader applicability? Yes, uh, several. Let, let me let me just pick at one. You, you have to, so in the pandemic, right, um, what really came uh, to bear um, right up front was the readiness of the services across the board, all right? So I mentioned the ship, right? We had to restrict, and we didn't do that. Uh, Pack Fleet did this, right? But they had to restrict port calls, for example. We wanted to keep the crew healthy. So there was a, a larger amount of risk associated with the safety of our teams. I mentioned shadow teams, right? We couldn't have our normal testing. We had to have backup people. We had to go through all the quarantine requirements. So that, that's one risk. From a technical risk perspective, right? We had to run a lot of high-end modeling to prove to ourselves that we could get on the range and not waste a target, not waste our time, not have the ship out there. So she, I mentioned the risk reduction of tracking an ICBM in a prior event. Um, that was building upon what the ship needed to do, but we had to run a lot of uh, high-end modeling and simulation to prove to ourselves that uh, we could actually go execute this task. And the risk was really down. We initially thought that closing velocity was gonna be the big driver. It ended up being the long propagated track with a lot of error in it. Uh, and it ended up being the divert. And now you have to manage, you know, do we have enough divert to, to do something like that? And again, the missile is not designed to do that, but perform, uh, perform flawlessly, so. Excellent, excellent. So a follow up from John, uh, in your opinion, what are one or two factors enabling MDA to sustain stakeholder support? Number one factors, I, I will tell you, uh, when you're different, when you have a unique set of authorities to where you're exempted from DOD 5000, and you have a unique requirements process, um, every time there's a turnover, right, within uh, the combatant commands, and it happens often, and in, within the services, it's a constant education as to why those, that charter's in place, why the SECDEF direction's there, why the DOD uh, directives are there. You have to go back and do that, because everyone else is trained across all the other, you know, the, the normal DOD 5000 processes. So the initial reaction, it's a very human reaction, is, boy, we want to normalize MDA and get them into the normal process. Right, so that's that's probably the, the best way to answer the question is to you know hey you got to do the work right when you come into a program, and you got to go understand why we put in place why what we have in place today, and then you have to recognize the benefits of that. I am always open to change and process, uh, you know, relooking how we do things. That's why we have missile defense reviews, right? So we had one back in 2019. We'll be uh, doing another one here uh, after the national defense strategy gets updated. So I'm always open to that. But I, I tell you what, I spent a lot of time trying to help people to understand the unique authorities that have been given to the agency and why we do what we do. And our processes are different and we're resourced for that process. Mm -hmm. So when you tell me I also have to go follow some other process so I can be normalized, well, now you're, you're really breaking me and slowing me down. Uh, and that's probably my biggest concern uh, when it comes to uh, continued success in the future. Yeah, that's been a continuous discussion from your predecessors as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
So Dr. Renee Rendon, uh, NPS Facility Contracting, asked a question about workforce. Uh, DOD acquisition training seems to be focused on program management. You referred to the challenges in managing a portfolio of programs with each program in different phases of the acquisition process. Do you think that DOD is sufficiently emphasizing training and education in portfolio management? Over. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's really tough. And I, and I have, again, this unique situation and, and it's probably not scalable, but if you were to look at the MDA organization, it looks a lot like looking into the Navy just on a much smaller scale. You have to remember we're less than 1% of the overall DOD budget, right? But I do have functional codes and I do have my PEOs, right? So I've got the program managers and we embed the engineering staff uh, through a matrix organization. We embed the contracting staff. We embed the mission assurance, quality and safety into that staff. We have uh, our uh, technology officers embedded in from the S&T side. Um, so, so that means you have to have all of those different tribes trained up and focused in on the mission. And for us, it's kind of easy, right? We're called the Missile Defense Agency. We wake up in the morning, we know what the priorities are, we know what the mission is. Uh, and so I would say that, uh, you know, we do follow the uh, the normal the defense acquisition uh, training cycles. And uh, right now I think uh, engineering is key. We do not want to give up uh, being able to go toe to toe with industry. You have to, you have to have a technically trained staff that really understands that. But you also need to have really strong logisticians and you have to have a strong contracting staff, right? Because we break, if we're not managing the budget well, if we're not managing contracts well. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, uh, we, we have a highly trained, uh, you know, just high-end uh, group of people here at the Missile Defense Agency. And by the way, as you know, Dave, we harvest uh, from the services, right? So we rotate them in and out, which is really great. So we learn a lot from that after I educate them on the unique authorities of the agency. Yeah, great. Uh, Ruben's got to come back. Uh, can you speak to Japan and Aegis Ashore? And I would take that not just Aegis Ashore in Japan, but Aegis Ashore in, in general, the PAA and that too. Over. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's a tough one. I, wanna, I don't want to get out in front of the government of Japan. So they made a decision back in 2018 uh, to build Aegis Ashore, um, you know, one in the north, one in the south. And if you, if you look at the coverage uh, for those uh, two systems, uh, that was their national missile defense. And I use the word was because they, they had a change in heart along the way. Uh, because of sighting issues for the launchers, uh, there was a concern about the drop zones, booster drop zones, right? Launch an SM3, it's going to throw out its booster, it's going to throw out its second stage. Where were those going to land, right? So they decided that they would move that capability to C and they're in the decision cycle now on what that would look like. I think I saw an article yesterday about you know, purpose-built BMD ships that would not deploy. Um, and that, that's just coming from the press. I don't believe or know whether or not that's the actual uh, you know, decision from the government of Japan at this point. But uh, what they are doing is shifting from ground-based to force, forces that we're gonna run those two Aegis shore sites and it's gone over to the maritime side. And so uh, working very closely with POIWS, staying synced up. Um, I guess the other interesting story about that one, and it's kind of an FMS discussion, right? I always, a uh, very smart uh, captain told me many years that the S in FMS stands for sales, which usually means it's a system that has been fully proven and is in operations uh, you know, okay. within the US. Okay. This was a unique case where they chose to not go with the current configuration. So Dave, you asked about current Aegis Ashore. So Aegis Ashore in Romania and what we're installing in Poland. By the way, we're really excited about Poland because we lifted the, uh, the fourth array yesterday. Oh, so arrays are installed. Okay. We're going to go to install and check out the Poland. Pretty excited about that. But a very important uh, capability out there. But it is the Aegis Combat System, latest Aegis Combat System, Baseline 9, with the SPY-1 radar. What Japan opted to do was to do more or less a competition through FMS for radar systems that hadn't been deployed yet. And they, they did a uh, direct commercial sales uh, for a different radar. So it's a different configuration. And it's uh, it really caused a, a lot of churn, uh, you know, across the, the department and internationally. But we're working through that. It'll be Japan's decision on how they want to settle that uh, downstream. It's likely going to be at sea. It could be something like an SBX or a big uh, golf ball that uh, was on one of the charts. I didn't uh, really spend a lot of time talking about. It could be a catamaran, could be a cruiser, could be a destroyer, could be multi-mission. Don't know yet. Uh, we're going to leave that decision space with Japan. Okay, great. Well, we have uh, one minute to go. So uh, any closing comments uh, from you? Uh, I very much appreciate your time. Uh, great presentation. Uh, great questions from the audience. There's a bunch more stacked up. Uh, I'll send them to you separately just so you know what you, uh, what you missed. Uh, and, uh, but uh, any closing comments from you on acquisition research or MPS or uh, the symposium? Over. 
Well, uh, th thanks, Dave. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in. I apologize for being late. I'm glad the, uh, the Wi-Fi device worked. I love the fact that you're sitting out there in the quadrangle staring at Spanagle Hall, which is a great uh, proud graduate of MPS and myself. I think we went through the same uh, curriculum. So uh, it, uh, I, the school is really important. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a national institution in my mind for a good reason. You know, when you apply and drive these degree programs that you guys work so hard to do to make them relevant to the United States Navy, to the Army, to the Air Force, those that pass through that school, and even the international crowds there, I can't tell you how many times I run into Naval Postgraduate School graduates. So I'm really proud to be an alumnus and uh, really uh, great to engage with you today. Uh, thank you for your interest in missile defense. Well, thank you. Appreciate your awesome. time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Take care.